Matthew chapter 21, starting at verse 1. This is on page 988. 988 in the Church Bible. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. I hadn't been here very long, some years, when Manchester City, I was living in Manchester, won the cup. And uh, the next day, my word, the place was full of huge crowds of people, waving banners, and the Manchester City came in an open-top bus going through. I mean, I just watched it on television. I wasn't really interested in that. I've never been too interested in things like that. But nevertheless, it was a remarkable event, packed. And I thought to myself, I wonder what it would have been like in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. Because although these Manchester City fans were very fanatical and enthusiastic, there were nothing, not a patch, on the Jews that day. Absolutely amazing scenes. And Palm Sunday is remembered for Jesus' entry to Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. But John, in John chapter 12, he actually gives us a bit more information. And in that interesting week before the crucifixion, we find that he portrays three groups of people which represent in many ways the people today in our society. Attitudes of people that were relevant then and are prevalent today. And also, it all boils down to this. Who is Jesus? How do we know Jesus? Why do we worship Jesus? We see Mary a few days before. She anoints the feet of Jesus. We see the crowds a few days later, enthusiastic, publicly, fanatical. And then we see the Greeks seeking a special audience with Jesus. The Greeks are always wanting to talk and chat information. The men did no work, just chat. The women did all the work. Always talking, always interested in something new, something fresh. All three at first hand had much in common. But a deeper examination will show that in each case, there's a world of difference. Mary, for instance, she gave Jesus the very best that she had, regardless of the cost. The cost of what she gave Jesus was just all her savings, really. She expressed her love, her devotion to him. She demonstrated her love and her commitment. She just recognized that Jesus was someone special. There was a uniqueness about Jesus. Mary hadn't actually fully understood all about Jesus, but she thought, yes, I'm committed to this man. He's amazing. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to commit to him. There she was, worshiping, honor. And basically, it's because he had transformed her life. He had touched her life, and she was devoted to him. There's the crowds. 
What a contrast. The triumphal entry of Jesus, huge crowds to Mary. Mary had actually burst into a little gathering of people. Only a small group of people. Nobody else was there. Nobody else could see how much she was devoted. But these people out in the open, shouting, waving their hands, taking their coats off, putting them down, that this king might come along. Publicly, unashamedly, zeal, commitment, you name it, they had it, certainly. Surely, this would have eclipsed all that happened the previous day with Mary showing her affection to Jesus in a private room. Here were people who meant business. The cause of Christ was their cause. They would follow Christ to the ends of the world. They would follow Christ in spite of anything the religious leaders knew. The religious leaders were not for Jesus. The people knew that the religious didn't like him. But they said, never mind, we're for him. Never mind what our religious leaders say. He was real commitment, dedication. Come out in the open, enthusiasm. And there was substance to all their support too. Amongst them, we see, were people who had witnessed and known about the rising of Lazarus. The people, they would talk to one another, say, do you remember? I saw this, I heard that, I heard the other. If Mary was aware that Jesus was someone very special, unique, these people were as well. <coughs> They'd seen his actions, had heard his words. With great zeal enthusiasm, they passed on the message from one to another. No wonder everyone was turning out. The word had spread. But a few days later, we see a different story. Mary was there. She was at the cross, not understanding, but still devoted to Jesus. The crowd were there. But a different message now. Not Hosanna, but crucify. You see, Jesus had not met their expectations. Who is Jesus to us? A challenge for us this Palm Sunday. And as we go into Easter, why do we worship him? Is it because he's the eternal son of God and savior? Because he's worthy of our praise? Because he is Lord, we follow and worship not so much for what he does, but because of who he is. Or he does things because of who he is. What he does is a reflection of who he is, but ultimately and primarily we worship him, we follow him because of who he is. Contrast the attitude of people today to kings and emperors to the past. In the past, the king was the king. His will, whatever he said, whatever he did, went. They honored him. I'm not saying it was right, but they felt he is the king. Now we have prime ministers. We vote for them. If they don't fulfill our expectation, we kick them out. Bring somebody else on. Now that's fine. But are we the same with Jesus? There was a Christian who made the remark, what's the point of praying or even coming to church? When God doesn't seem to answer my prayers, notice my prayers, I ask, he doesn't give. He doesn't seem to, well, give me what I want. It was Job who said, though he slay me, yet will I praise him and trust in him. You see, Job had a vision of God as he was. It doesn't matter what God does. He is God. I know I can trust him. I don't understand. In the midst of all his suffering, though he slay me, yet I will praise him. God has never and will never come to you asking for your vote. He will come to you asking for your life. And that because he needs to exchange your present life for an eternal life. God will not come as an elected president or prime minister, but as an eternal Lord. I've mentioned this before, I'm sure. We have a similar situation in John chapter six, that people are amazed at Jesus. He feeds them, he says wonderful things to them, they follow him, they want to make him king. But towards the end of the chapter, he starts saying to him, just a minute, I've actually got a different message. We live in a sinful world. You're sinners. You need to repent. I'm talking about eternal life. I'm talking about a commitment. I'm talking about repentance and faith. No, no, so we want you to give us what we want. 
and they turn away. And as I've said to you before, he turns to the disciples and says, what about you? You, you, don't, you don't need to follow me. Can you imagine people coming to church and the vicar saying, you know, you don't need to come here. If you come here, there's a challenge. We say, come in, come in, welcome. Now, it's right, we should welcome them. But sometimes, do we produce the challenge? Do you confront with a challenge? Jesus calls you to a commitment. A commitment will transform your life. He wants to give you eternal life. Not a passing, fleeting time of pleasure and fulfillment. Peter said, what do you mean, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. There's nowhere else we can go. We are here with you. So what about us and Jesus? Why do we follow him? Why do we worship him? It's not understanding. It's being prepared to trust in him. I've come across people who claim to be Christians, involved in church for many years, and then something goes wrong, disaster strikes them. And I find, interestingly, a different reaction. Some turn away and say, fine, no more, I've finished with you, God. And others say, Lord, I don't know what you're saying. When I was at school, I came across this man. I'd only just become a Christian. I began to understand the wonders of being a Christian. He was our RE teacher. He'd gone to Oxford University. He was a very, very bright young man. Everybody accepted him to stay at university at Oxford, become a don there, perhaps a professor there. But in his final exams, he didn't do very well. He was disappointed. His family were amazed. What on earth went wrong? But he said, you know, he said, the best thing that ever happened to me, instead of becoming a don at the university, I went to Africa as a missionary. Telling people about Jesus, I was able to see life transformed. He was a man who was an architect. He had a huge architectural practice in Cheadle Hume. Well, in, so down south, he lived in Cheadle Hume when I first met him. And uh, the practice was prosperous. He had, you know, a couple of Land Rovers, Range Rovers, a huge house in its own grounds, very rich, very wealthy, a lovely Christian man. And then all of a sudden, for something went wrong. And contracts went by and his firm failed. He hadn't done anything wrong. He couldn't understand. He sold his house. He sold his business. Well, what, nothing of the business. He sold his land. He went to Cheadle Hume, to Bramhall there. He bought a, a, a semi-detached house. He went to the church. And he became a non stipendary vicar. He trained for the ministry, not to be paid, just to help the vicar. He said, the best thing that happened to me this apparent disaster, he said, set me on a different I would never have left my architectural practice. I loved the job. But he said, I realize now this is amazing to serve God in this way and preach the gospel and minister to people. You see, they didn't understand, but they experienced the reality of God's presence and his power. What is Jesus to us? Do we blame him when things go wrong? We say, Lord, I may not understand, but I trust in you. And then there's the Greeks. Very brief. You see, the Greeks were used to, uh, well, talking, conversation, discussion. And these Greeks came to Philip, because Philip, of course, is a Greek name. And he said, Philip, you know, we want to see your, this teacher of yours. We're interested. You know, in Greece, where we are, we, we, we're always discussing religious things. And of course, they were proselytes. That's why they were in Jerusalem. They believed in the Jewish faith. And they came along and they said, we want to meet your, your master. Introduce us to him. Interestingly, we found no record of Philip taking him to Jesus. Jesus turns away and says, just a minute. He says, no, no, no. I'm not interested in discussion. I'm not interested in answering people's questions. I've come with a mission. And my mission is to die on the cross, to rise again, and offer to people new life. I'm not just for discussion. I've come for commitment. And there are people who are interested in the Christian gospel. They're interested in Jesus. They'll talk about him. They'll teach about him. A great teacher. Time and again, I come across people who say, hey, what a great teacher. Look at the Sermon on the Mount. No man could preach like that and say things like that and teach. He's wonderful. I say, no, he's not wonderful. He's the savior. Do you remember the musical Jesus Christ Superstar? 
people came along, what a wonderful thing, what a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, musical. I said, no, it doesn't do justice to you. Jesus is not superstar. He is almighty God. He's the creator of the stars, the universe. People are interested in Jesus, but just are you interested in a commitment? And first of all, look at yourself. You need a savior. You don't need a philosophy or a guidance for living. You need a savior. Take hold of my hand, repent, turn, believe, trust in me, and I will transform your life. So many people today, they'll come along and say, yes, we're interested. We've got to challenge them to a commitment. What about us and Jesus? How do we view Jesus? As the Lord, the Savior, the Master? Why do we follow him? Because he gives us what we want? What happens when things go wrong? At the grave of Lazarus, the shortest verse, two words, Jesus wept. He felt for the family. Jesus feels for you. If you're going through a difficult time, and when we all go through difficult times, he is compassionate, he cares for you. He doesn't say, oh, don't worry, forget it. He wants to be near you to experience your, he, he understands your pain. At the end of the day, he wants to give you life, eternal life. Not a fleeting, temporary easing of the situation. Not something cosmetic, something transforming. Mary was there at the cross. The crowds were too. Mary was there at the resurrection. The crowds weren't. I believe Mary was there at the ascension too. And at Pentecost. The challenge for these three interesting pictures is what about us? Are we like Mary, committed? Committed because we've opened our lives to Jesus. And we know, I pray and trust that day by day, you will know the reality of his presence. My prayer for our two grandchildren is, Lord, I want them wherever they are, any day, every day, whatever their circumstances, they'll have that awareness, the Lord is there by their side. That experience of the reality of his presence. In Hebrews, read the, we have a quotation of the Old Testament where the psalmist said, the Lord is at my right and I shall not be shaken. Whatever happens, whatever the situation, I shall not be shaken. I was talking to a lady the other day and she was concerned about her daughter and the circumstances. I said, look, we commit her to the Lord and pray that wherever she is, she'll be conscious the Lord is there by her side. Mary was aware Jesus was Lord. She didn't understand, she trusted. Are we like Mary? I pray we will be. Why? Because he's touched our lives. Have you opened your life to the Lord? Do you worship because you're savior? Let us pray. Lord, open our eyes to see more clearly in our hearts or to respond to your amazing grace. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen.